chairman of uh, Hale Advisors uh, in Chicago. Uh, who's next? Uh, Anthony Lung, Senior Managing Director and Chairman of Greater China Blackstone Group in Hong Kong, but of course also uh, Distinguished Former Financial Secretary of the Hong Kong SAR. Uh, next to him is um, Oki Matsumoto, the CEO of, uh, of Monix Group, Investment Bank uh, in, uh, in Japan. Uh, next to Oki is Tabasu, Chief Executive Officer of the Dubai Financial Group from the UAE. And my old friend <coughs> on my immediate left, we've done uh, many of these sessions at, uh, at Davos uh, together. Uh, needs no introduction in, uh, in Tianjin, Xu Min, uh, from the Bank of China. David, I want to start with you. Give us a perspective uh, after the last uh, extraordinary two weeks. Uh, of, where the, uh, of where the dollar stands now, where the international currency market stands now, uh, what's likely to happen, whether uh, there is a flight uh, from, uh, whether we're already seeing a flight from the dollar to other currencies, uh, what will happen if the financial package goes through on Monday morning, or if it doesn't go through. Uh, give, us, give us a brief synopsis, brief okay. David, <laughs> brief synopsis and then we'll take it from there. Very good. Well, I think the first point we have to understand is that we've had a world economy characterized in the last few years by huge financial imbalances that have been highly complementary. Over the last four years, the developing countries have run an aggregate current account surplus of two and a half trillion dollars. This year alone, it will exceed eight hundred billion dollars. It's these big surpluses which have helped to finance the U.S. current account deficit over the last few years. They've allowed America to have low interest rates and to have the great housing boom, which set the stage for the recent financial crisis. Now, over the last year, we had until July a very weak dollar because the major burden of dealing with this financial crisis, the downturn in the housing market, the big decline in real estate prices, fell upon the Federal Reserve. Ben Bernanke thought nine months ago that this crisis could turn into a new Great Depression that the banking losses could be so large they would overwhelm the American financial system. We've already written off in nine months over $520 billion of bad loans, half the losses in America, half in Europe. The total equity capital of the U.S. banking system is $1.3 trillion. The IMF estimates there will be a further $500 billion of losses in the next six or nine months. So Ben Bernanke did several things. He slashed interest rates from five and a quarter to two percent. He's injected $400 billion of liquidity. He's allowed the Federal Reserve to prop up Bear Stearns for a takeover. And last week, he rescued AIG. These are policy events we've not seen in America since the 1930s. And the reason he's done this is he's a student of the 1930s. Six years ago, he gave a speech for Milton Friedman's 90th birthday party at the University of Chicago, outlining all the mistakes the Federal Reserve Board made 75 and 80 years ago. And he began the speech, finished the speech, by saying to Mr. Friedman, we'll never make those mistakes again. So he's taken the burden of protecting America from the financial crisis. And the result was he had to let the dollar collapse over the last year, fall 10% against the euro, fall 15% against the Australian dollar. And he told me in April in a private meeting he had no choice. But now the burden is shifting from monetary policy to intervention by the Treasury with a $700 billion rescue package. And this package will be meaningful because I think, based on the IMF research, we only have five or $600 billion of bad debt still to write off. And if the government can now buy these bad loans from the banks, take them off the balance sheet, this could next year stabilize the U.S. financial system and set the stage for a better economy in the second half of next year. So this package is critical. If we get this package, there'll be a further big rally in financial stocks. The risk of bankruptcies will diminish. If we don't get this package, we will have in the year ahead three or 400 bank failures. We'll have tremendous uncertainty. Bank stocks will fall further. And America will have an ongoing credit crunch because as the banks fail, as we lose equity capital, our capacity to make loans will diminish. So we should view this package as a positive for the economy and therefore a positive for the dollar. There'll be a big budget deficit. It could be a trillion dollars next year. But we'll be able to fund it because we'll still have access to these imbalances. I had lunch at the People's Bank of China on Friday. They told me they're going to slow down the appreciation of the currency here. 
If they do that, they have to intervene. So China will be providing for America next year another two or three hundred billion dollars of demand for U.S. Treasury bills. Saudi Arabia will keep financing America because Saudi Arabia has a military relationship with America. Saudi Arabia needs American security, so Saudi Arabia buys dollars and holds on to them. So I think we'll be able to fund these deficits, and if we can, the dollar will be in a trading range, and then ultimately, with a better economy, have a recovery. <clears throat> Thank you, and that was that was exactly what I wanted to uh, to uh, to get us going. Exactly what I wanted. Oki, let me let me turn to you. Uh, from the Japanese perspective, uh, you've uh, you've long experience of uh, of watching uh, watching all this. Tell us how things look, and do you agree with David that uh, what happens in the next 24 hours, well, well, whatever we are now, Sunday, we're still Saturday night in uh, in New York. What happens in the next 36 hours? Uh, is crucial to how financial markets and currency markets move. But I think that uh, uh, unexpectedly, uh, I tend to agree with David. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you know, when I, but in a different reason. Uh, the, I think uh, the, what's happening in the States is very similar to what happened in Japan like 10 years ago. And uh, Japan needed to lower the interest rates and Japan needed to uh, spend a lot of uh, fiscal money uh, to support the financial institutions. And it, it deteriorated the Japanese uh, government's balance sheet a lot. But the yen didn't deteriorate. And actually, uh, when the um, non-performing loan program started happening in Japan, which, which was, I believe, 93 or 94, the dollar yen was trading 125, I guess. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the yen strengthened to 79 yen per dollar at the beginning of 95. So the, the deterioration, I, I, I think, you know, that this uh, you know, entire thing happening in the United States should deteriorate the United States government balance sheet, which is bad. But it doesn't necessarily mean the, the demand for data will really decline because, the, uh, the, as David said, there is some demand for the, for the data. I'm seeing in Japan, uh, you know, Japanese uh, uh, individual investors being very famous for buying uh, 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 non-yen denominated uh, mm -hmm. foreign bonds. And uh, that, is, uh, that activity is getting subdued right now, but I believe that is a kind of a temporal phenomenon. And once things uh, are coming uh, calm down, I believe uh, uh, that the famous 14 trillion dollars of uh, Japanese uh, personal financial assets uh, we'll come back to buy foreign assets, including uh, dollar notes. So that, I think that is going to uh, limit the downside of the uh, dollar, I think. I'm, uh, I'm, getting a, uh, I'm getting a kind of feel of dollar bulls around if, uh, <laughs> if, uh, if things go... Steve, you can, we'll bring you in a minute. Uh, if, uh, if, uh, if things go well on Monday. Uh, Anthony, uh, I know you can't talk directly um, about your experience in Hong Kong, and I don't want you to. On the other hand, you do have a unique perspective, and if you can kind of fly at 35,000 feet, uh, of telling us what the benefits have been uh, for certain economies, if you like, uh, of, being of having their currencies pegged to the dollar and having the stability uh, of, uh, and the certainty of knowing uh, what the value of that currency was likely to be? Well, a pair currency would introduce discipline, right. discipline to the um, both the monetary as well as the fiscal side of the government that adopts such policy. Obviously, the, that is a good thing, but on the other hand, it also means that you have limited flexibility uh, in managing your economy through such policies, meaning through exchange rate policy or monetary policy, because you are surrendering to the currency that uh, you are packed to. Which means that in, in times of extreme movements, uh, you have to allow or at least um, accept the fact that the real economy itself will have to adjust. So if um, the um, if times is bad, and uh, say, for example, uh, after 1997 in Hong Kong, uh, after a bubbled economy, um, the adjustment would have to happen. You either would have to devalue, which we didn't, or you have to accept the fact that uh, you have to let the real asset price 
in Hong Kong to adjust, which obviously is very painful. Uh, most government may not want that, right. particularly if you have to um, somehow appease the voters, the popular people. You rather blame it on somebody else through the exchange rate, uh, rather than accepting a deflation, and deflation is very difficult to deal with. Um, so you have those kind of policy options, um, and maybe that explains why most people would not um, like to pack their currency, because you are surrendering the monetary policy to another uh, central bank right. or uh, another uh, monetary board. To a certain extent, it uh, touched on an, another issue, which is outside of the pack exchange rate. Uh, obviously, I understand that most people are interested in um, hearing the prediction from the panel about what is going to happen to the dollar and to the various sets of currencies. But on the other hand, if you look at uh, the currency situation in the longer run, uh, after 1971, when uh, the world left uh, essentially the gold standard or actually packed to a real currency, uh, the supply of money has overtaken the supply of real commodities. Okay. So besides just looking at uh, the currency values against another currency, uh, maybe one should examine um, what is going to happen to the real prices. Before the last few weeks, uh, people would uh, be arguing that maybe in the long run, those people that have a lot of cash, particularly in the United States uh, dollars, uh, should move more into real assets. But uh, with the events in the last few weeks, uh, I'm not even sure of that. Uh, to a certain extent, I think it's also what OK is saying. And that is while um, many governments around the world, including the US, would incur huge budget deficit, and that may be inflationary, but because of the possible changes in the financial infrastructure, right. including investment banks from now on cannot leverage as much as before, because they'll be governed under the bank, uh, uh, by the banking regulator, there may be a, a very uh, significant deleveraging happening in uh, the United States and possibly in the West. And when you have a deleveraging, it tends to be very deflationary. Right. And if it is deflationary, then you can tell what is going to happen to the uh, currency in the case of Japan or um, against the real commodity. Uh, that may not be a very good move, right. uh, too. So I'll just stop here. Um, Sayanta, how does all this look from... Uh, I, I'm, I'm saving my last question on this round for you, Mim, because... Um, well, I'll explain why in a second. But how does this look from the Middle East? I mean, you have... Um, Places like Dubai that are growing at, a, at, a, at an East Asian clip, uh, you have astonishing uh, amounts of investment. Um, how, does, uh, how does this look from there? Thank you. I think uh, I'll uh, start off uh, answering the question by uh, talking about the inflation right. that you're seeing in that region and uh, also uh, talks about currency revaluation in the region. But when you uh, go back to the point that uh, David made, that ultimately uh, David and Anthony made about the fixed uh, exchange regime, um, it's difficult to see why uh, countries in the Middle East would want to move out of the uh, fixed exchange regime. Even though uh, countries like uh, Russia and China have looked at um, uh, a bipolar currency regime, which could be the trend going forward, um, but ultimately, if you look at the U.S., if you look at the size of the economy, if you look at the military power that it has, it's difficult to move the dollar away from the leadership position. Yes, it's come down from 70% of the reserves to 63%. Could it come down to 50%? Possibly. But uh, I'm a firm belief, believer that over time, uh, countries which want to move out of a fixed currency regime would potentially move to a bipolar currency regime. But not just, just explain what you mean by a bipolar. Regime. Bipolar, it's basically having dollar and euro. And, right. As the, as the mainstay 
of, uh, of, uh, of a currency basket rather than uh, having it pegged to a single uh, currency because the challenge with the dollar today is you have the US uh, interest rates at a very low level and you have countries which are pegged to the dollar having high inflation. So what do these countries do? So, uh, so one of the solutions potentially is uh, looking at a bipolar thing where you have the uh, European countries focused on inflation-based uh, uh, currency, uh, uh, inflation-based interest rate regime, and you have the US which is very, very market-driven. And that gives you a very good balance when, uh, you want to, when, when you want to look at your own currency. So I'm much more of an uh, advocate that you know, over the next, I don't know, five to ten years, you will potentially have dollar and euro being the two cornerstone. Uh, now, as you mean, uh, one of the themes of, uh, of the last few days here in uh, Tianjin uh, has been, of course, uh, the continued uh, growth of the Chinese economy, the continued uh, rise of China to a position of significance in, uh, in the global economy. Someone said to me uh, last night, well, this is it. This is, this is the moment at which focus shifts from, uh, from the U.S. economy to the Chinese economy. You've been making this point in, uh, in many Davos sessions of the, that uh, no matter what was happening in some parts of the world, the Asian economy was kind of growing uh, very fast. How does, is this, is this a, 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 a defining moment in terms of the um, dominance or hegemony, if you like, for the U.S. economy and U.S. authorities in, uh, in the global economy, or is it just one stage in a long process, one, one event in a long process? Well, that's, uh, that's a big question. I know. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's not a million, it's a billion dollar question. Um, I would say it can be a one step of the process, right. but it can be a change. I, a slight different with, I think David and Aki a little more optimistic, but my Middle East friends is more pessimistic on the other side. I'm sort of uh, between though. I would like to make it from uh, here, uh, uh, three very simple observations, and uh, Steve here, uh, you can correct me, I mean, I'm obviously I'm sure you have a lot of comments. <laughs> the first thing is I think uh, the dollar will be uh, volatile in the short term, regardless of whether it's a $700 billion do dollar bill passed or not. Uh, I'm sure that the, the bill will be passed, but uh, and because this is the whole big thing, so the implementation is really the key issue. So, I mean, how do you implement it? How do you define the class of the assets? How do you define the, the institutes who will take it? Yeah. And uh, this is the whole thing. Because everybody, I mean, it's not a CDO square, it's a CDS and CDS square. Everybody is interlinked together. Uh, it's a very difficult to pull them out. And plus, it's 700 billion, as I mentioned correctly. If you're looking for a Japanese model, you need a capital. You don't need a liquidity. So during the process, many, many companies will, 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 will failure, will die. So you will hear the bad news day in, day out from market. So in that case, the people were not looking for U.S. assets. Right. But for another purpose, you have to distinguish two different demands for U.S. dollars. One is for liquidity, for security purpose. One is for investment purpose. Today, if you're looking for the New York Fed, the custodian of foreign assets custodian in the New York Fed actually increased, not decreased. So that's pushed the demand for dollar. But as is really for the liquidity person because everybody's scared to death. But the demand for investments, I was the actually on downsides. So you have to dis distinguish two different things. With, with all this bad news in the market, I expect to see uh, more bad news in the next few weeks from markets. The dollar will be very volatile. I mean, the 700 billion things on the table just stabilize, just to kill the, the panic, right. but even not rebuild the confidence. There are three crises, confidence crisis, liquidity crisis, and the solvency crisis. It's a long way to solve all these crises. The dollar will be volatile. I think it's the number one point I would like to make. Right. The second point I would like to make on long term, that's back to your question, the dollar will be weak. Dollar will be weak, I think, uh, because it's, it's obviously. Today, it's Uncle Sam saved the Wall Street. But the question is, who will save Uncle Sam tomorrow? I mean, 
the Uncle Sam put $700 billion on tables, $200 billion on Fed and Fannie, $85 billion for ARG. I put them all together as a $1.8 trillion together. Who will finance this $1.8 trillion? David is optimistic. David says, you know, China and uh, Saudi Arabia will come back to buy bonds. I'm pretty much, much you know, uh, doubt about that. Because today, foreign financial uh, government own 1.5 trillion U.S. Treasury and one trillion, less than 1 trillion U.S. agency papers. Right. Add them together, 2.5 trillion. The agency paper is gone, so you have only Treasury paper today. Can you ask the foreign government, the foreign agency hold another 1.8 billion trillion in addition to the 2.5 trillion paper? Absolutely not. So the second one, what the U.S. government can do is they print the money. Right. If they monetize the whole thing, so then well, everybody here run into the huge inflationary situations. Right. They'll kill everyone. Either way, you issue the bonds, you print the money, the dollar will be on down side. Right. So I think if you're looking for the future 18 months and what, 24 months, the dollar will absolutely on downsize. So there will be exactly a point that the dollar is on the way to change. But how fast and in what degree is still the question. My third observation is I would say dollar is still the dollar. Because dollars today still account, as uh, my friend says, dollars still account 64% of the world foreign exchange reserves. Mm -hmm. More importantly, dollars still account roughly 60% uh, of the data foreign exchange trading. Okay. Dollar account 68% of trade settlements. I mean, US trade only account 11% of right. world trade. That means whatever you do, whatever trade you do, and you pay and you receive dollars. That's a dollar. Yeah. I don't think that will change in short terms. In say three, five years, my friends say uh, uh, the foreign reserve dollar came down from 64 to 30 percent. I don't think that will happen that dramatic. Um, I think they will, they will take some dollars to the dollar, but t the dollar will not be the yesterday's dollar. That's for sure. Yeah, I'll stop here. Thank you. David. Just a couple of points. Um, no doubt many people are alarmed at the prospect of a trillion dollar budget deficit, and we can ask questions, as Zhu Min just did, as to whether other countries will finance it. But the reality is, if they're running these huge current account surpluses, the money has to go somewhere. And the U.S. financial markets are still the largest and the, uh, the most dynamic in the world. Now, there is clearly the risk of inflation coming out of this policy if the Federal Reserve Board has to monetize the budget deficit. But that is not Ben Bernanke's objective. Ben Bernanke's objective right now is simply to stabilize the financial system. And as Mr. Leung just explained, we are now in the process of massive deleveraging. And deleveraging will be deflationary. So I think the major risk over the next one or two years is in fact deflation, not inflation. And this federal budget deficit will be a sideshow compared to these very, very powerful deflationary forces in the world economy. A year from now, 18 months from now, when things have stabilized and improved, I think Ben Bernanke will want to raise interest rates to hold inflationary forces in check. But he can't do that right now because of the problems he has with the U.S. financial system. In 1931, the Federal Reserve Board raised interest rates to protect the U.S. dollar after Great Britain left the gold standard. The Fed raised rates from 1.5% to 3.5%, and Ben Bernanke wrote in his books this greatly worsened the Great Depression. He did not want to raise interest rates to protect the dollar in the last year because of memories of what happened in 1931. And because of this deleveraging process, I think he believes, and as I do myself, that deflation is the great risk, not inflation. Did you mean you wanted to come Yeah, uh, uh, I always agree with David because David uh, knows everything. Man. But uh, <laughs> today is a slightly different, David. What's going, on, going wrong here? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I agree with the deleverage going on, that's for sure. I mean, the few things, number one, if you put the Goldman, put the, the Morgan Stanley into the bank, bank holding, they have to cut their leverage ratio right. for 40 times to, right. say, 12, right? right? So it's 28 times it's gone. Right. So it is a trillion dollar banks, and everyone is deleveraged. So certainly it's a great, the, you, you see, you mentioned deflation in the treasury. No, that's true in a normal situation, but today what we see is because the deleverage, it made dollar denominated assets become much, much less attractive. And deleverage will have a huge impact on the, on the demanding on dollar. So in that sense, I would think the dollar will be very weak. So before you see deflationary pressure, you will see inflationary pressure first. Right. And in, inflation uh, 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 will kill deflation. Uh, I think this is the different today's situation 
compare with a few days before. Anyone else want to come in on this on this debate between the two ends of the uh, of the table? Sianta, uh, give give me a give me a sense uh, from the Middle East on the confidence, uh, the Gulf, if you like, on the confidence with which um, these fast-growing economies uh, view the U.S. authorities' handling of the current situation. Um, I wouldn't be able to answer from the government's perspective, but uh, what I can say as a market participant, I think um, uh, you have seen uh, uh, the Middle East potentially participate in some of the uh, right. U.S. Uh, situations. So I think the confidence is always there. I think the confidence that U.S. is still a $40 trillion economy and, as David said, people will come out of this people, and uh, it may not be in six months, but over an 18 to 36-month uh, cycle, all of this would be forgotten. So, uh, I forgotten? Forgotten? Yeah, it will be seen as an opportunity. Uh, potentially, uh, people will look back and say that this was a great opportunity. So, I think there is, there is a... There is a the overall, you've got to look at the, the uh, history of U.S. coming out of such problems historically. Anthony, did you want to come in? Well, I think it's very difficult to predict currency prices. I was a trader in 1975, and I mean, obviously, many, many people in the room may not be born then. And I recognize that predicting uh, exchange rate uh, is highly dangerous. We talk about uh, inflation, deflation, uh, budget deficit, um, and that kind of thing. But money supply is, as we all remember from our professors, is monetary based times velocity. And I think that with the deleveraging, the velocity is going to come down significantly. But besides just looking at all these, we also have to think about two other factors. The first is that, uh, at least in the short term, the entire world is very concerned about the uh, stage or the state of the financial system. And people would take their money to a safe place. I think for the time being, it will be fairly hard to replace the US dollar still as the currency of uh, safe haven. Uh, if there are instability, where can you put your money? I mean, besides gold, which uh, in the age of deleveraging, um, you may not want to put too much in that commodity as well. So, so you really have very little choice. The second factor that you also have to consider is the size of the investable assets in that particular currency. I mean, people uh, have been uh, arguing that uh, if you think about the world's GDP, uh, very soon in the future we will s we'll probably see a uh, free polar world, not a bipolar world. Uh, you see the United States having one third, Europe is getting close, and Japan and China would be also getting fairly close uh, as well. But on the other hand, um, that may be the GDP, uh, but if you look at the amount of investable or kind of accessible uh, asset classes that international investors can put your money in, so just by looking at proxies such as the size of the capital markets, the US dollar or the U.S. capital market is still about half of the world's uh, investable uh, capital market. So, so even if you want to hold more in, say, yen or euro, there isn't a lot of things that you can put your money into. So, so while I uh, kind of share uh, uh, Min's point that theoretically uh, people should get out of the dollar in reality, there, there isn't a lot of things that you can actually put your money into. And in the meantime, if you're worried about safety, uh, US dollar is still probably the currency of choice. I, I want to get quick comments from Oki and Jumin on that point because I can see Oki agreeing with it. I'm not sure that you do, and then we'll go to the then we'll go to the audience. Oki. Well, I agree with Anthony. Uh, when Japan faced uh, the, the uh, uh, as you said that uh, you know uh, the leverage in the states is quite uh, scary, but still uh, in Japan in, in the past. Uh, in that lost decade, there's a huge deflationary uh, pressure. But still, uh, yen didn't decline much. Right. Actually, it mm -hmm. once strengthened. And as Anthony said, you know, the liquidity has to be invested inside the globe. It cannot go to the, the, the space. 
Right. Mars. I was, I was in a session <laughs> on, on... So it has to find a place to invest, and then the U.S. has... I mean, there are only a few countries right. who have developed the quite deep fixed income markets. Right. And U.S. is clearly the number one. Right. And, uh, you know, the all reserve type of money has to find that kind of places. So I think, uh, you know, yes, in a short term, that will be somehow suffered. But I believe it will find a good uh, flow. Jim in quickly, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I notice you have a very interesting point. And uh, we obviously live in a very difficult time. That's, that's very clear. Now, the government, U.S. government, have to stabilize the financial market. But uh, the key issues are what cost. Currently, it seems to me, because of the dollar session, the cost is a pretty dramatic weakening the dollar. But if you're looking from a global perspective, the Wall Street the financial market obviously is very important for the global economy. But dollar is more important for the global economy. So we've got to be very careful. We're looking for the current situations. So yes, it's very challenging, but we have to look for what will happen in the next 24 months. And a weak dollar will be the killer for everyone. Let's, uh, let's go to the floor, Steve. You caught my attention first. Uh, microphones uh, will uh, send gentlemen here next, and uh, hands going up all over. Good. So, David, under your trillion dollar budget deficit scenario, which is certainly not unreasonable, uh, the U.S. current account blows up to roughly 8% of GDP, which means the U.S., the world's greatest debtor nation, <coughs> then would need somewhere around 4 and a half to $5 billion of capital inflows each business day of the year to fund itself. To my good friend Mean's point, um, how can the U.S. possibly fund itself of that magnitude without having to make further concessions in, in the currency and or long-term real interest rates. Isn't it rather cavalier of you to say, well, where else are they going to put it? Everybody's going to go yep. for dollar-based assets. Um, maybe they do, but it, the question is at what price? Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, there's a market adjustment that lies ahead. Part of the adjustment might be that as in the Reagan years, 20 years ago, we have higher bond yields. We've had very, very low bond yields in recent years because of Fed policy being easy and because of markets being confident about inflation. Maybe we'll need a government bond yield at 5% to make the market clear as opposed to the 3.8% we had this week and the 3.4% we briefly had a few days ago. Um, secondly, the fact is, is that this budget deficit is going to be somewhat misleading vis-a-vis -vis the current account deficit because it will be basically designed to buy assets. And at some point, the government will sell those assets, three years, five years, ten years, and that will then create the possibility of a surplus. So it's really a very unusual kind of deficit. It's not to fund traditional spending on arms or civil service salaries. It's really to buy assets. So it's not quite clear how it will work through vis-a-vis -vis the current account deficit. Meanwhile, we are having, going to have here in the current quarter the first decline in U.S. consumer spending in 18 years. And we could have another year of weakness in consumer spending, which in turn would set the stage for a higher household savings rate. And if our household savings rate goes from a negative number back to plus 2 or 3 percent, that will also on the margin help to contain the current account. The fact is our non-oil current account deficit has shrunk in the last year by 1 percent of GDP. What's kept the deficit high is the big oil price increase. If we now get the oil price decline that began in July, if that continues, that could also set the stage for U.S. Uh, current account improvement. So there'll be a price at which the market clears, and my guess is we will have somewhat higher bond yields, but not something that will be catastrophic or further worsen the housing downturn, which is currently going on. David, can, can you or anyone else on the, on the panel remember what was the eventual outturn of, of accounts on the RTC, on the Resolution Trust Corporation? Well, Resolution Trust was ago. launched back in 1990 not to rescue banks or thrifts, but to buy the assets right, okay. that came when they went bust. In that period, 1988 to 92, a thousand thrifts went bankrupt. And the government spent, over a period of five years, over $400 billion buying the assets. And when it sold them off, 
it got $200 billion back. So, so the overall, net 200, loss, a net. overall loss to the Treasury was about $200 billion over four years, over five years. This program is different. This program is designed to prevent the banks from going bust by buying their troubled assets. So this will prevent banks from failing if, in fact, the government can pay a high enough price for the assets to allow banks to sell them. And this is a big uncertainty, because right now, most banks have written these assets off to 80 cents on the dollar, and the market price is 25 cents. So somewhere in between, the government has to find a price to protect itself, to make money, but to also protect the banks from failing. And yeah, we just don't know what that price is. Yeah, but David, uh, sorry again. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is the wrong day, and uh, we have to have a drink afterwards. <laughs> I still want to see a wife, and so. Uh, um, RTC, I think there's three things very important about RTC, remember that one. Number one, they buy the bad, bad assets. Yeah. Number two, assets, not capital. Number two, yeah. lowest the price. Yeah. Number three, thousands of banks go bankrupt. Yeah. Okay, that's con consequence in addition to all the money government spends. Now, today, uh, the, I think the government made it very clear. The $700 billion uh, package will buy the assets at the lowest price. Mm. So the question is, where the capital? So if, if by the lowest price, it's still RTC. If we pay the lowest price, we're not going to rescue the banks. Exactly. Banks are not so this is a two things really contradiction to each other. One thing is about the yep. lowest price because they said very clearly in the yep. public to the Congress. And number one, they, they try to protect the bank to not go bankrupt. I don't think you can do two things together at the same time. We've got a contradiction, and Ben Bernanke said in his testimony on Thursday that what the government should do is pay a price that reflects long-term value, not the immediate market. Here we get into the question of our accounting system. We went to mark-to-market -to rules right. a few years ago, right. which forces these huge write-downs, even if the banks don't ever plan to trade the securities. Now everyone wants to come in. Oki okay, coming <laughs> first, and then uh, Cyan. Well, right. This is really, really the you know the discussion we tend to have had yeah. ten years ago uh, yeah. in, in Japan. <laughs> okay. And well, we're having it now. Yeah. Better late than never. People never change. Right. People never change. And uh, that time we created the exactly same thing, the kind of company or governmental you know, uh, scheme to buy the bad assets from uh, you know, failing Japanese banks. And what happened is nobody sold assets because they had to, show, they had to realize the loss. They had to be, like you know, talking about compensation, those kind of things, they didn't want to be you know, uh, told that kind of things by the government. So nobody sold the assets to this, uh, you know, this entity. So, you know, uh, about two years or three years later, the government needed to decide to uh, inject capital directly yeah. to those uh, failing banks. And I think the U.S. is going to have to do that. Right. $750 billion yeah. is not big you're enough. Not, you're not the only person who thinks that. Yeah. <laughs> you're not the only person who thinks that. Uh, yeah. No, I want to make a point on, uh, take on from where David left it. I think the uh, accounting rule change which happened late last year, uh, the FASB 157, um, potentially may have uh, uh, created this transparency which the accountants talk about. But uh, I think there is economic value and mark-to-market value. On the mark-to-market value, you're marking against an index which is traded maybe 100, 200 million dollars a day. And on the other side, you have an asset which is one and a half trillion dollars. So uh, I think that's the difference which you're talking right. about, David, economic value and mark-to-market value. Uh, so if you move away from transference into prudence, I think a lot of these problems will be solved. So uh, I, I tend to agree with you that you've got to look at economic value, which is the real value, versus just being transparent and looking at a mark-to-market value. Gentleman in the front here. Wait, please wait for the microphone. Please uh, just say who you are. Um, Atta Mutabara from Zimbabwe. The world is going through a global economic crisis because of the financial crisis in the United States. Given the interdependence of our nations, given the interconnectedness of global challenges, isn't it prudent for us to move towards global governance systems while we talk in terms of a global current system, not the US dollar, not the euro, but a global current that is independent of any nation? Because today's largest economy is tomorrow's smallest economy. We need a much more sustainable answer. What are your views around the idea of a global current system, global standards, 
so that we don't have to readjust trade flows. We don't have to reweight international assets. What is the view around defining and adopting a global currency system independent of the euro and the dollar? He wants to have a go there. Well, we had a global currency 30 years ago. Under Bretton Woods, all exchange rates were pegged to the U.S. dollar. And we had that system for 30 years after World War II. And then it broke down because of the contradictions in the U.S. balance of payments, the belief the dollar was no longer as good as gold, and so on. The idea of a global currency has been talked about by a few academics, but nobody believes right now it's realistic because we just couldn't get a consensus on the issues to do that. But we have some experiments in regional monetary union, led by Europe, and that, I think, is a fascinating process to watch because, well, it's only 12 countries. Even 12 countries is a huge challenge. Italy has falling productivity. Germany has booming productivity. Germany can live with a strong currency. Italy has to devalue every, week, every year. How will they make this work? We don't know yet. It's a big, big challenge. So we could have, over time, a return to narrow exchange rate bands, maybe more currency convergence, but that still is difficult because there are such huge imbalances in terms of national economic policies and national economic priorities. There's no doubt your country benefit from a global currency. Zimbabwe has an inflation rate of 10 million percent. And the first thing you have to do with this new reform program is fire your central bank governor and peg your currency to the rand. Uh, but Zimbabwe is a very special case. Other countries won't regard a currency peg as a clear-cut solution. Min, yeah. yeah, I think that the gentleman raised a very important uh, issue. Obviously, uh, the globalization go much, much faster than the global governance. Right. That's the, the really the global risk, not for the government, for, for all the business, for everyone here today. Um, also, with David, you know, it's very difficult to structure global currency. Although, uh, the IMF do have sort of uh, uh, SD, uh, yeah. SDS, yeah. SDR uh, standardization. But I will say, David, I agree with you, it's very difficult to uh, construct a global currency, but the, don't you think now is the time for the everyone, um, bring everyone to the table seriously to consider rebuild the global governance or global right. financial architecture? Well, I think, that, I think that's I mean, been one of the themes of this it, weekend. Yeah, it is a very yeah. important issue. Yeah. I mean, I, it's, it's recall me, I, it's very interesting, 10 years ago, when we suffer from Asia financial crisis, the IMF is everywhere, you know, giving the med medicines and giving the instruction yeah. guidelines in Indonesia, like this. yeah, right. Indonesia, right. Philippines, and Thailand, everywhere. But where's IMF today? Well, unfortunately, they'd have to just kind of walk around the corner, and they they, they seem to find it harder to kind of walk a few blocks in Washington than to fly to Jakarta, I as it were. Time, it's a time for really for those multinational. I think I think I, I predict. Go to the table. And sit down I predict that at Davos in January, one of the one of the key themes is going to be talking about uh, is going to be talking about global governance yeah. issues. Actually, let's uh, let's get some more questions. Gentleman right here, first. Yeah. Uh, no. There, and then I'll then I'm there and then I'm there. And then I'll yeah. <laughs> My name is Mark Zavadsky. I work for Russian Business Magazine Expert. Uh, we've been told that uh, almost 60 percent of all trade is done in dollars, although it is a share of. U.S. In, in GDP is only uh, 11%. Or, like right now, the only alternative, like basically, is Europe. But but the share of Europe is also not that big. Now more and more trade are going through Asia or coming from Asia. Do you think that we will see emergence of a new of a new currency, a yuan, a won, maybe a ruble, that will become a competitor to euro and, and dollar in terms of, of a global trade currency? Thank you. Okay, John David. Yeah, I think. Um, of course, you know, naturally, there will be more need for other currencies to be used. But I think at the end of the day, uh, more countries need to develop the uh, uh, fixed income markets, including uh, euro. There is no sovereign bonds right now for euro. And that is a big problem. And when we talk about, uh, you know, the constant usage of the cu currency or, the re or reserve, you know, the fixed income market is very important. So if it's, uh, you know, China, or ECB or Russia, I believe uh, you know it's very important for them to develop uh, fixed income markets. Anyone else want to come in on that? Well, I think there's a clear perception that the RMB, the Chinese currency, will become a reserve currency right. someday because of the sheer size of Japan, China's economy. The fact that this year, for the first time in the history of the world, 
Germany will be, China will become the world's top trading nation. It'll have larger exports than Germany. That's extraordinary for a country that 30 years ago had no foreign trade. So given China's evolving role, there's no doubt the RMB will assume a global role in time. But right now, China doesn't have capital account convertibility. It has many restrictions. We're talking 20 years from now, not the next few years. Uh, just here, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yes. I'm a journalist of 21st century business heard. I want to ask uh, Liang Jinsong. Um, some analysis said because the Blackstone has some business about subprime bonds, so maybe the Blackstone had predicted uh, subprime cr crisis. So if the Blackstone had mentioned the crisis before the CIC invested in Blackstone. And the second question I want to ask Basa and Jumi. Uh, some economists said it's the bottom of the subprime crisis. So uh, if your institution have the willing to invest in Wall Street financial assets, thank you. Actually, <laughs> mm. <laughs> well, I uh, didn't quite get the first question 100%, but uh, Blackstone is not an uh, active player in the supply market. Uh, we are a long-term investor in private equity as well, in, as well as in real estate. Yeah, that's uh, a good question. Uh, we're open. Uh, from a business point of view, we're looking for all the possible business deals uh, everywhere. Thank you. Gentleman right in there, and then over there, yeah. and then go. Thank you. I'm a, a reporter with the China Business News, Di Taiyin Rebao. I have two questions, one for uh, Mr. Zhu Ming and another for Anthony Liang. Well, okay. uh, my, my first question is, uh, now that you have fight in 18 to 24 months, uh, US dollars will be weak, right? And uh, what's the uh, implication to China's uh, management of its huge dollar demand denominated assets? And uh, what's the implication of the internationalization of the renminbi, as uh, the Mr. Hill has mentioned a little bit? And my second question to Mr. Liang is the, about the Hong Kong's economy. Uh, if Hong Kong still packs currency to the uh, US dollars, on the one hand, you have the appreciation of the renminbi. On the other hand, you have the possibly, highly possibly, you have the depreciation of the U.S. dollars. So what's the impact on the, uh, uh, the Hong Kong's economy in the, in the short term and in the mid term? Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you. It's a very good question. Uh, as I mentioned, my second point, dollars on downside but also at the third point, I say dollar still the dollar. So that means in the short term or even in the medium term, we don't have a substitute for dollar. So in a certain way, we have to live with it. Now, the negative impact from downsized dollar is not only limited to the exposure of a dollar assets you hold. The real issue is the dollar changes everything because dollar changes, for example, uh, commodity price oil price and commodity price. And the exchange rate is volatile in the market and have a quite a big impact on trade. And I would say those big impact will be more profound, more, in, more important impact than the direct impact from the dollar exposure we hold this end from China. Because that will be, have a macroeconomical impact. I think those issues we have to look, look into that um, in the next 18, 24 months. The second issue for IMB, I'm very much agree with uh, David said, uh, and uh, uh, Chinese economy is very strong, uh, and uh, that's true, and RMB is getting stronger and stronger. But number one, two things are very important. Number, number one, RMB is not convertible. And number two, the most important issue is we don't have a very uh, a good uh, uh, in-depth and in-size IMB denominated bonds market. Uh, this is a very important thing before you say the currency will be the global legal tender. Yeah, thank you. Anthony, do you want to comment on Hong Kong as well? Well, Hong Kong is a very small economy, uh, but a very open economy, and we are probably the most open economy in the world. So we are subject to forces uh, from everywhere, uh, not just because of the currency. While the people can, may predict that the revenue is going to appreciate against the US dollar and therefore Hong Kong dollar in the long run, but uh, we are also subject to all the forces around the world, including the one that we talk about, and that is uh, we may see 
a deleveraging process which will cause prices around the world to come down. And I believe prices in China may also slow down because of the slowdown in the economy as well. So while a weak US dollar may lead to a weak uh, Hong Kong dollar, which by the way, uh, I'm not predicting that, um, we, uh, in terms of the economy, the inflation uh, will moderate, hopefully, uh, because of the uh, deleveraging process in the world. And the Hong Kong economy will continue to grow, the real economy will continue to grow because thanks to the growth in China. Right. I think there's a question over there, yeah, just here. And then I can see some of the bad which I'll get to. Uh, a question from me, from Mr. Anthony Liang. I'm from Inside Magazine. And to our knowledge, because of the devaluation of the U.S. dollars as well as the subprime uh, loan crisis, many Chinese banks and the bank and the company of Huiying Company has suffered a lot of losses. So from these losses and from your perspective, what lessons can we draw upon to avoid further losses in the future? And first of all, I'm not the uh, advisor for Zhongtou Company. And the Zhongtou Company is an investment company established by the People's Republic of China for the long-term investment. And as a long-term investment and with a huge amount of capital, so for everyday business and we cannot count and how much we have earned or how much we have lost on a daily basis because we should, shouldn't, they shouldn't act like the small investors. But for the Zhongtou company and uh, the large national investor comp investment companies, they should take a longer perspective. Secondly, many, in many cases, and it's very difficult to master, to predict uh, the highs and lows of the markets. And uh, the establishment of Zhongtou company uh, was just before the financial crisis. And including the investment to Bai Shi Tong. And if we say the investment to Bai Shi Tong is a lot, suffered a loss, but we should consider this as a long-term investment. Even the investment in the A-shares market, and uh, certainly now we see some losses now. So it's very difficult to choose the right time. But for the large investors, usually we